Hey, this is Jonathan with Limitless Mindset, and this is my book review of The Porn Myth, Exposing the Reality Behind the Fantasy of Pornography. And this is a book that I completed recently, and it has changed uh, my views somewhat on th- on this uh, on this topic that is uh, apparently occupying about half of the internet sorry about this quick interruption i've got an important call to action for you please go watch this video and subscribe to limitless mindset over on one of the alt tech platforms, Rumble or Odyssey. And that is where you can catch my latest videos along with browsing my entire library of content and videos and podcasts. Over 700 pieces of edifying content about biohacking, nootropics, smart drugs, anti aging, life hacking, about my pragmatic, full-spectrum, anti-fragility philosophy. If you value health freedom, I urge you to get outside of your digital comfort zone just a little and vote for the kind of future you want with your attention. Join and use the pro free speech, social media platforms. I have the links below this video to where you can connect with me on those platforms. I do pay more attention to the comments that I get on those. Please don't procrastinate any further in taking back your freedom and your privacy from big tech. Don't even pause this video. Just pick one of the alt tech platforms. I think that Odyssey is the best. It's kind, it's a lot like YouTube. It's as good as YouTube as a video platform, but there's no annoying ads interrupting the videos. So just pick one of those. Again, I've got them linked below and join it in another tab or window while we get back to what you clicked on. So I'm going to be quoting from the book and dropping some of my thoughts and observations and insights into that, but first I need to get you up to speed with some internet drama that ensued this last week. So this last week, I became the most hated man on the pro free speech social network minds.com. And I still like Minds. I'm still there. I haven't been kicked off or anything like that. But I became the most hated man, the most hated user, undoubtedly, on this network, at at least for a couple of days, because of a video I dropped making the case for banning porn on the social network. And the video accumulated something like 200 angry, hysterical, vitriolic comments. So I uh, count that as uh, something of a accomplishment. And I can anticipate your knee-jerk reaction to the sentiment, to what I was trying to do in that video there. You may be thinking, okay, I'm a libertarian, uh, pro-free speech kind of person. And if you're familiar with Minds.com, which is, uh, despite the some of the objections that I had, it is a very good social network. I recommend that you join it and follow me at Jay Roseland there. 
your your sentiment is probably your 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 if you're much like me or much like I was, you're probably thinking, okay, I'm a pro free speech, pro free expression, anti censorship kind of person, and porn is speech, so porn probably belongs on a on a free speech kind of network. You know, maybe I don't love that, but you know, hey, it's speech. Well, in the video, I break down, I explain why porn is not speech, and I give 10 real good reasons to ban porn. And you can go and check out that video if you want to as I go a little bit more in depth uh, in there, but I'll just synopsize my argument for you here, is let's just go and look at the definition of speech. It is the faculty or act of speaking, the faculty or act of expressing or describing thoughts, feelings, or perceptions by the articulation of words. That's from the American Heritage Dictionary. Another definition is the power of expressing or communicating thoughts by speaking. So you might be starting to see my point here. Porn is not the expression of thoughts or ideas. I have never learned anything from watching porn. It's animalistic grunts with sometimes a very thin veneer of bad acting. Importantly, I can't remember a single thing ever said in a porno I watched. And think about this yourself. Can you remember a single thing said in a porn? Probably not, right? And this is because porn does not communicate anything or anything remotely uh, reasonable. If porn is speech, then farts are speech. If we're, if we're going to make speech such a wide category, then the, uh, the tooting that, uh, that I do occasionally, which hopefully this podcast microphone will never catch, then that is also speech. No, no. Speech is something that should express ideas, thoughts, something with a modicum, with a quantum of meaning. And porn does not. Y you can remember probably hundreds of different lines from movies that you've watched, but I bet you can't remember a single thing ever said in a porno. And that's because porn is not speech. Porn is porn. It falls into a category all its own. And you're probably a pro-First Amendment, pro-free speech kind of person. That's, that's what dominates my crowd, I believe. And so you have the idea that you're like, well, if it, if it falls under the First Amendment, if it's free speech, then, you know, hey, we got to let it be. And there's a great meme on this. I'll find the meme and I'll attach it to the article that is linked below this podcast. But as the meme goes, when the founding fathers of the United States enshrined our right to free speech in the First Amendment, which was a revolutionary courageous thing to do. It was by enshrining the right to free speech. That was a, a really tremendous moral step forward for, for, for uh, I would say, for at least the people in the United States, but it's something that's uh, inspired, uh, it's inspired humanity into moving into a, a freer, better world. And when they did that, they were not thinking or intending to protect porn. They were trying to protect political speech 
that might challenge tyranny and injustice. And porn, importantly, porn serves political tyranny and injustice. That's right. There's a really excellent book on this. Maybe I'll review this book at some point. It's called Libido Dominandi, Sexual Liberation and Political Control. And the uh, idea in the book, what the book validates is this thesis that uh, sexual liberation and porn, it allows for political injustice. And then it had a bunch of interesting case studies. Maybe you want to put that one on your reading list. So I went and made a short video saying we should ban porn because it's not really speech and it's, uh, it's annoying. It's, uh, it's, it's not moral to host porn on a website that teenagers are using. And this just brought down an avalanche of mean comments upon me <laughs> from the users of this uh, pro-free speech website that I uh, like quite a bit, that I'm usually on pretty much the same kind of wavelength as the people there. And I uh, realize that I'm uh, in an uphill battle here because libertarian-minded people have been brainwashed into believing that porn is speech. And I say brainwashed because you can probably remember back to when you were a teenager or perhaps you were even younger when you were in grade school. And the one thing that they made sure we learned when we were in the public schools, the one libertarian thing that they made sure we learned in public schools was that porn is free speech. That was the one libertarian thing. So that should make you suspicious about it. That is uh, not something that you have been reasoned into. That is something that was just uh, fed into your uh, mind as a receptive youth. And if porn was speech, then you would be able to, you'd be able to remember things from porn. If porn was speech in the same way that we can say that a movie is speech, well, there's movies that I can say have, have that I've learned things from. There's movies that have inspired me to try new things in life. There's uh, movies that woke me up to something going on in the world. And if porn was uh, speech at all, there would be things that you would have learned from it. There would have been things that you can remember from it. And when I pointed this out on the free speech community, people were not happy. So at least though, nobody can accuse me of being a conformist. Uh, nobody can uh, nobody can accuse me of being a guy that's kind of stuck in a, 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 an ideological bubble on the internet where I agree with everyone else in that bubble. And that's awesome uh, because I pride myself on being an arbitrary contrarian. Those are two cool words, aren't they? And when you think arbitrary contrarian, the most famous arbitrary contrarian was Klaus von Stauffenberg. And Klaus von Stauffenberg was portrayed in one of Tom Cruise's few really good movies. And that was the movie Valkyrie. Go watch that movie again. That is a fantastic movie where he is the Nazi that is trying to assassinate Adolf Hitler. And after I saw that movie, I said, I, I need to look up this Klaus von Stauffenberg guy and find out a little bit more of the history of him. And there was an interview with his uh, with his wife uh, after he was killed uh, by the 
Nazi regime firing squad. There was an interview with his wife, and she said about Klaus that he was an arbitrary contrarian, that if he was in a room full of people that kind of believed one sort of thing, he would argue with them and he'd try to, he'd try to pick out their uh, logical uh, reasoning blind spots. And then if he was in another different type of room full of people, then he would argue with them. You could never quite nail him down because he was just an ardent free thinker, an ardent, um, an ardent, deductive, philosophical person that was looking to disagree, that was looking to figure out where people were wrong, even if those were the people that were kind of in his camp that he agreed with. And that philosophy uh, led him to doing this extremely courageous thing of trying to take down Adolf Hitler and history would have gone a whole lot differently if he was more successful. Remarkable thing to think about. Go go check out that movie. So being a arbitrary contrarian, I'm against mainstream toxic things. I'm against all of the mainstream toxic things, be they uh, radiation that has all these uh, negative downstream effects. I am against crappy uh, fraudulent health supplements that contain heavy metals. I am against shampoo, which is rife with endocrine disruptors. And I'm also against porn, which is poisonous and toxic. And my learning experience from this week was that a lot of libertarian kind of people are very resistant, very resistant, and actually get pretty angry uh, when presented with the idea that porn is anything less than sacrosanct free expression. So I'm going to make the case here using this book, the porn myth explaining, breaking down why it's absolutely toxic. All the references for what I discuss here are in the book. If you want to know more about porn, read the book. But there's a mistake to be made here that I want to preempt, which is that a lot of times people are resistant to positive change unless there is a dramatic amount of evidence presented uh, giving them a reason to make a positive change in their life. And in this book, all the evidence is presented. There's a multitude of footnotes and studies, which I'm going to do a quick overview of later on in this podcast. But the fact of the matter is that I don't really need to cite all of that evidence to make my case here that porn is toxic, that it's probably something that should be banned from everywhere that it could be banned. And here's why is you, uh, particularly if you're a man, you can do a lifestyle experiment with porn and you can find out and see for yourself, experience for yourself, just how toxic it is. If you watch porn frequently, if it's like an everyday kind of thing, or a couple of times a week, or once a week, do a period of no fab. Start by aiming to just do two weeks of no fab. And then once you pull off two weeks, then try to go for a whole month. And then once you've done a whole month, try to go for 90 days. And you'll experience for yourself a 
a mental detox and you'll find that the sky is a bit more blue. You'll discover that uh, flowers are a bit more red, white, yellow, all the colors that flowers all are. You'll find that uh, birds singing in the trees are just a bit more musical. You'll awaken to the beauty in the world that porn is is holding a uh, blindfold over for you. And the longer that you can go off porn, you'll experience more clarity of thought. You'll experience more drive and motivation. You'll find more joy in the beauty of normal women that you can actually interact with out there in the, the real world. I don't need to make a conclu I don't need to make a lengthy scientific case for the destructiveness of porn because you can experience it for yourself by simply going off of it for a while and seeing how life is just a bit more vibrant. And you can, of course, reflect on your past if you've gone through periods of time where you were using way too much porn. Those were periods of time where you were a bit, probably a bit depressed, where you weren't mentally very sharp, where you weren't accomplishing a whole lot in life, where you weren't really driven to do very much dating, where your social life kind of went through a slump. Uh, those were likely periods where you got sick a lot, where your immune system was pretty weak. You can simply, on the basis of your own experience and your own self-experimentation, which is what really matters, you can see for yourself how toxic it is. So, this podcast is for men, mostly, that want to enjoy a rich sex life with real women, with uh, real good, virtuous women, I might add, and edifying sex life that infuses the rest of life with zest, joy, and meaning. And if you need a little more evidence that porn is standing in the way of all that, I'll provide it here. So, let's dive on into the book. And in the introduction, they had an interesting comparison. Get this. In 1869, in an attempt to spur a growing American silk industry, the etymologist Leopold Travolt made the mistake of bringing the gypsy moth from Europe to Boston. Is that the correct Boston accent? Probably not. Sorry. Sorry, Bostonians. Within 10 years, swarms of gypsy moths were devastating forests with their voracious appetite. Attempts to eradicate this moth failed time and time again, and for the next hundred years, it was an uncontrollable pest. Then, in the 1960s and 70s, scientists devised a new strategy. Biologists knew that the male gypsy moth found the female moth by following her scent, her pheromone. So scientists developed massive quantities of a synthetic version of this pheromone and scattered small pellets of it from the air over infested forests. The effect was overpowering for males. They were so overwhelmed by the highly concentrated pheromone that the uh, that they either became confused and didn't know where to turn to find the female 
or became desensitized to the lower levels of pheromone naturally produced by the female. Either way, the moths failed to reproduce themselves and their population declined precipitously. By way of analogy, this is what pornography is in our society, a synthetic yet highly concentrated pheromone. Having been overexposed to it, many people either become either confused or disinterested in real sexual intimacy. That's a great uh, analogy isn't it? And you can go and look at the uh, declining uh, birth rates in uh, first world, the quote unquote, first world countries. And you can see the reproductive rates declining precipitously. And porn is not the only factor in it, but I'd argue that it is a significant one. Next point. And this is a point that I made in my video there on Minds, is being anti-porn is not anti-sex. It is anti-internet addiction. And the book says, and it is precisely because I'm for sex that I'm against porn. Whether we're talking about misogynistic women hating porn, or the gentle girl-on-girl -girl variety. It is pornography as a medium that is the problem. Porn is the business of presenting women's bodies to men for masturbation. To stand against this is not to stand against sex, sex generally, but to stand against a habit of solo sex that turns men into consumers, not lovers. So yeah, that's something that I reiterated. Uh, you'll f people will if you're anti-porn, people will say some will misconstrue you as being a, a religious, old-fashioned, uh, moralistic crusader kind of person, and that's not it at all. I am a huge advocate of more people having great sex with other people, with uh, good, virtuous partners in a monogamous relationship. I'm all about that. I want uh, everyone in the world to have all the crazy sex that they want to have with a good person, ideally a good person that they're married to, in their own bedrooms. And porn is a tremendous uh, drug that, like those synthetic pheromones that they use to depopulate the moths, um, that's something that stands in the way. Okay, next thing that's important to mention is unrealistic standards set by porn. Quote, when men and women were exposed to pictures of female centerfolds from Playboy and Penthouse, this significantly lowered their judgments about the attractiveness of average people. Pornography literally changes our standard of beauty. And there's a uh, study that that references the significance of heavy pornography involvement for romantic partners. And I'll drop an anecdote on you in regards to this, because you might say, well, I, I, I don't care about, you know, beauty, beauty standards. I don't, I don't think porn is affecting my beauty standards. And back in the day when I was kind of into the pickup artist thing, I would travel to different cities and then I'd go and find uh, guys in uh, internet groups to go out to uh, the nightlife scene or to go out and do day game. And I would have this experience over and over and over that would baffle me a bit is I'd be out with a wingman and I'd see uh, two or three cute uh, women there, uh, approachable opportunities there in the venue. And I'd say, 
hey man, let's let's go for let's go for these two. Let's go for these two over over here. Do you want to open or do you want me to open? And the guys would say, oh, they're not hot enough. They're not good looking enough. And they were certainly good looking enough. And I was I was baffled by this. I was like, what? I was like, I, do you expect them to look like Megan Fox in her prime? What like what is it? What, what does it hurt? So I, you, you'll experience this uh, certainly with, with your friends is that people will get uh, unrealistic expectations of beauty from the porn. And this is something that is going to cost you uh, opportunities to, uh, to get a girlfriend, to, uh, to get dates. Your, your standards uh, beauty that you demand in uh, potential partners should be realistic. They should be something that's in line with what's considered a healthy young lady in your geographic area. And they should be somewhat proportional to your own beauty to, you know, if you're spending a ton of time in the gym and you've got a great six pack, then you can, you can have a bit higher standards yourself. That's the thing about standards is when you have standards for other people, you need to take a look at the man in the mirror. Okay. So next point, porn is not art. And this goes back to the, the some of these misunderstandings that libertarian kind of people have is they're like, well, if if something's art, then it's uh, free expression. Then you know, then we should just allow anything that might be art. And the author Matt Fraud of the book writes, no doubt the line between pornography and art can be blurry. Some say that the artistic value of porn is in the eye of the beholder. Perhaps it is, but at the end of the day, porn is not created for the sake of beauty. And true art is not created for the sake of masturbation. Good point. Nobody is going to disagree that the primary purpose of porn is masturbation. If we didn't masturbate, we wouldn't have porn, right? So it, I, I, unless me farting is art, then porn is not also art. I'm a believer in definitions. I'm a believer that there are lines, that there are philosophical, empirical lines of meaning that fall in between words. I believe that two plus two equals four and that four times four equals 16. I'm a person that believes that there are some truths in this world and I'm a person that believes in uh, specific and nuance. So if you think that porn is art, then I will just, uh, then I will, uh, I'll offer a, uh, an NFT of me farting, uh, and I'll sell it for, uh, I'll sell it very, very, very affordably. You won't need very much Ethereum to afford it. Okay. Let's move on to talking about the effects of porn addiction from the book about 64% of no fabbers. These are people that are uh, that have quit or are trying to quit porn had developed tastes for porn that had become extreme or deviant. Among the 27 to 31 year olds in this group, so that's that's relatively young men, 19% were suffering from premature ejaculation. 25% were totally disinterested in sex with a partner. 31% had difficulty reaching orgasm. And 34% were experiencing erectile dysfunction. That's remarkable. So men in their late 20s, early 30s, a third of them were experiencing erectile dysfunction. Our... Our grandfathers, they would be so ashamed 
of this generation, right? Good news, though. After joining the NoFab community and quitting their porn habits, 60% found that their sexual function had improved. And part of the book addresses the CP question. And you know what that means. He writes, My point here is not about whether virtual child porn should be legal, but about the willingness of pornographers to push the envelope so that men can lust after what their brains interpret to be children. So a lot of these people that are uh, pro-porn, that think porn is pretty okay, pretty cool, they're the same people that are probably uh, enraged and absolutely opposed to child porn. But this is deeply, deeply hypocritical. These two things are attached to each other. Porn is the gateway drug to child porn. And this is detailed in the book. I'll share another anecdote to this effect with you, though. There was a podcast I was listening to. It was the Prepping 2.0 podcast. I'll try to find this episode and link it up in the notes for this. And they were interviewing a law enforcement person that would uh, catfish pedophiles on the internet. I'm you may have seen YouTube videos of people doing this. It's it's a courageous, very gutsy thing to do that I that I, I I'm thankful that that people are willing to do this. So he would catfish uh pedophiles on the internet. He would catfish people that were on like the dark web that were trying to buy children on the dark web. So he would uh, talk to people, uh, trick them that he, that maybe he was a child or that he had a, a child to sell. And then there'd be some sort of transaction, I assume. And then he would go to like meet the person and I'm thinking Walmart parking lots. And then the police would be there to arrest the person. And what the guy explained in the interview is that this is something that there's heightened demand for. There's more people than ever that are that are looking to make that sort of awful, disgusting uh, purchase. And this is because porn is the gateway drug. This is because people have develop a tolerance to porn. And as that tolerance increases, they need more and more extreme stuff. And that eventually pushes them into, uh, it pushes them into uh, the gay porn, the tranny porn, then it pushes them onto the dark web where they start looking at things that are totally illegal to look at. And of course, they they hate themselves the entire time that they're doing this. I, I can't imagine the incredible amount of shame, but they're totally addicted. And their addiction drives them to take things to even more extreme levels. So, you, you might think, hey, you know, I don't have that that big of a problem. You know, I'm just going to Pornhub.com. I maybe, you know, I'm maybe watching a, a threesome video or a POV video for a few minutes. Then I log off. You know, it's not that big, de big of a deal. But that's where all of these men started. And then it ended for them with them being arrested in a, in a parking lot trying to buy a a, a child. So you want to you want to think about that that pipeline. If if uh, if that if anything else should motivate you to leave this vice behind. Speaking of crime, I'll quote Ted Bundy, and 
Here's what he said. I'm no social scientist, and I don't pretend to believe what John Q. Citizen thinks about this, but I've lived in prison for a long time now, and I've met a lot of men who were motivated to commit violence without exception. Every one of them was deeply involved in pornography. On porn withdrawal, porn's power to produce experiences of excitement, relaxation, and escape from pain make it highly addicted. Over time, you can come to depend on it to feel good and require it so you don't feel bad. Cravings, preoccupations, and out-of-control behavior with using it can become commonplace. Porn sex can become your greatest need. If you've been using porn regularly to get high, withdrawal from porn can be as filled with agitation, depression, and sleeplessness as detoxing from alcohol, cocaine, and other hard drugs. In fact, people in porn recovery take an average of 18 months to heal from the damage to their dopamine receptors alone. And in closing, I'll peruse the brain studies on porn users, which is in the appendix of the book. At the writing of this book, every study offers support for the porn addiction model. No studies falsify the porn addiction model. The results of these 30 neurological studies and upcoming studies are consistent with more than 180 internet addiction brain studies, many of which also include internet porn use. All support the premise that internet porn use can cause addiction-related brain changes, as do 10 neuroscience-based reviews of the literature. So some of the studies that were done by Gary Wilson of Your Brain on Porn, Neuroscience of Internet Addiction, A Review and Update, Sex Addiction as a Disease, Evidence for Assessment, Diagnosis and Response to Critics, Neurobiology of Compulsive Sexual Behavior, Emerging Science, Should Compulsive Sexual Behavior Be Considered an Addiction, Neurobiological Basis of Hypersexuality, Compulsive Sexual Behavior as a Behavioral Addiction, The Impact of the Internet and Other Sexual Issues, Cybersex Addiction, Searching for Clarity in Muddy Water, Future Considerations for Classifying Compulsive Sexual Behavior as Addiction, Is Internet Pornography Causing Sexual Dysfunctions, a Review with Clinical Reports, Integrating Psychological and Neurobiological Considerations Regarding the Development and Maintenance of Specific Internet Use Disorders, and Interaction of Person Effect Cognition Execution Model. Wow, that is a mouthful of a title. Let's read the Summary. This is a review of the mechanisms underlying the development and maintenance of specific internet use disorders, including internet pornography viewing disorder. The authors suggest that pornography addiction and cybersex addiction be classified as internet use disorders and placed with other behavioral addictions under substance use disorders as addictive behaviors. And then there are a lot more studies in the appendix. I will, however, just share with you one of them that caught my eye. This was an fMRI study. 
brain structure and functional connectivity associated with pornography consumption. The Brain on Porn, 2014. This Max Planck Institute fMRI study found less gray matter in the reward system, dorsal striatum, correlating with the amount of porn consumed. It also found that more porn use correlated with less reward circuit activation while briefly viewing sexual photos. Researchers believed their findings indicated desensitization and possibly tolerance, which is the need for greater stimulation to achieve the same high. The study also reported that more porn viewing was linked to poorer connections between the reward circuit and the prefrontal cortex, a common addiction-related brain change. So the effect that porn has on the brain is not entirely dissimilar from what you get with narcotics, where you have a narcotic that gives you an incredible dump of dopamine. This, you know, that's why we say, oh, that concert was dope. That movie was dope. That party was dope. It's because of dopamine. It's because that is a chemical that makes us very happy. But when you artificially, synthetically stimulate that chemical, what you do is you get desensitization of your dopamine receptors. And this means that all of the natural things in life that are supposed to make you happy, all of the things in life that are supposed to bring you that silver lining of joy around the, uh, the mundanity and the times when life isn't going so good, all of those things you become numb to. And you uh, talk with anyone who has history with uh, drug addiction, and they will describe just this thing. They'll say that, you know, I needed my drug so that I could feel normal again. Eventually, my addiction got to the point where I didn't even feel very good on the drug. I just felt normal. I just needed to uh, get straight or, or whatever the expression is. I, I don't, I don't know. And so the fMRI study and a, a multitude of other studies that are referenced in this book are making that same case with porn. And I guess I'll circle back to my original thesis that got me so much hate on the internet, which was that porn should be banned uh, everywhere that it could be banned because of the, the poisonous toxic effect of it, but doubly so because porn is free. I think of porn, I think of society's current relation to porn as if every single store that you might see, and especially the stores that were near high schools or middle schools or elementary schools. Imagine if every single store gave cigarettes away for free to children or teenagers. That's the equivalent situation that we are now facing on the internet with porn. We are offering people a incredibly seductive and addictive and toxic drug, and we're making it totally free to them. And that is an intolerable situation. And that's where I'm willing to uh, stand up and uh, disagree with all of these misled libertarian folks and make a couple of enemies out there. Well, I do hope that this has uh, inspired you to maybe leave this particular addiction behind. A, a life of meaningful 
great sex, a life of real carnal joy beckons. It awaits you once you can leave behind this addiction. I hope that you go out there and get it. If you're in need of some more tips and life hacks and strategies to get over this addiction, you can read this book. It has some it has some great how-to sections with a lot of real good ideas. You'll want to check out the presentation that I did on life hacking, self-control, and you'll want to stack a lot of those life hacks. And of course, I'd also be willing to help you with this. I am a uh, life coach myself. I'm an accountability coach and I would be willing to work with you and keep you accountable towards this particular goal, which if you can overcome this, uh, a lot of other things in life become easier. I'm Jonathan with Limitless Mindset, looking forward to a continued conversation with you.